Well, comedian and talk show host Brian Copeland knows how it feels to be an outsider. He grew up in San Leandro during the 1970s and was the only African-American student in his high school class of 350. As a kid, he weathered physical abuse from his father, discrimination by local police, and efforts by a racist landlord to evict his family from their apartment. He shaped those experiences into a one-man show, not a genuine black man. The 10th anniversary production opens this week at Berkeley Rep. Copeland sat down recently with Scott Schaefer, but first a clip from KQED's archives of Not a Genuine Black Man in 2005. I don't even know what that means. If you're talking about pigment, yes, clearly I am black. But if you're talking about some cultural delineation, I don't know. I don't talk ghetto. When I hear the word axe, I think of it as a noun. <laughs> it's not a bird. I'm going to ask my mother, what are you, Lizzie Borden? Get out of here. Brian Copeland, welcome. Thanks, Trav. Is it bad form to laugh at my own jokes? No, not at all. Not at all. We're all laughing. So the show begins with an anonymous letter from uh, someone who, who accuses you of not being black enough. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, when you boil that sentiment down, what do you find? Uh, what you find is that there are is there are people in every culture who uh, believe that they are the police uh, and they're the ones who get to determine whether or not you are really an African-American or really a Latino or re I had to think with Mike Wallace a few years back and he uh, asked me what the show was about. I told him and he laughed and he said, you know, every time I do a story that's even the least bit critical of Israel, I get all these letters saying, you're not a real Jew. Yeah. A genuine Jew would never criticize Israel or, under any circumstances. But the letter, uh, does it, I mean, the sen that sentiment could come from an African-American. Right. It could come from a white person. Yes, it could. Or anyone else. Uh, so is it different depending on who it comes from? Um, I think it is. You, you, I do hear it more or have heard it in my life more from African-Americans. And that letter came from an African-American. Um, although from white people you do get, well, it's not like you're black. It's not like, you know, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, excuse me, I, you know, that, that, the, the first uh, uh, question at the YouTube debate in 2008 when Barack Obama was running yeah. was, are you black enough? Yeah. And he said, well, I can't get a cab. <laughs> um, there is a, a riff in the show that I want to I play a clip from where you talk about racial authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to play that and then we'll come back and uh, talk about it. Okay. <laughs> what is it that makes the racial authenticity of a successful black male in this society suspect? What, what is it? Because, you know, it really pisses me off when I think about it. Because you go to the speed corner of East Oakland, Bayview Hunters Point, and you'll see all these guys selling crack. And all these guys with five babies by five different women, none of whom they're supporting, and nobody's saying they're not real black men. Brian Copeland, that's a very provocative question. What is it about uh, a success that makes mm -hmm. uh, authenticity suspect? What, what well, do you make of that? I just think it's bizarre. It's, it's the crab and the barrel mentality. Uh, that in in some way, if you have have uh, transcended your your origins, you are in some way selling out. Um, and I just find that fascinating. That they will point for their folks who will point at a Bill Cosby, for example, and say that you know Bill Bill Cosby's not really black because of what it is he's done and achieved and accomplished. However, you know if if Bill Cosby were standing on a street corner selling crack. They might say other things about him, but they'd never say he's not black. And I just find that to be bizarre. You know, yeah. what is it about success that that is uh, that is somehow a betrayal of your culture? I don't get it. Yeah, this show is told much of it through the through the eyes of an eight-year-old boy, mm -hmm. you uh, living in San Leandro back in the early '70s, uh, and it has some of the most difficult uh, themes: uh, domestic violence, your father knocking your mother against the wall, uh, your attempted suicide. And yet it's very much interwoven with all that is humor. Mm -hmm. Talk about that juxtaposition. Well, when I first started to write this show, I knew the rhythms I wanted. I wanted the rhythms that Norman Lear had in those great sitcoms from the 70s. Because as, as a kid, my mother used to sit us uh, on, the, we'd sit on the floor, she'd be on the couch, and there's a family, we'd watch All in the Family and Maud. And remember how like All in the Family was really funny and then Edith got raped. And this is a sitcom. It's like, where did this come from? And uh, then it was really funny again. Uh, and that's how life is. And so I watched the first two seasons of All in the Family, and that's how I came up with this. You know, one minute you're laughing, then you're kicked in the gut. And then you're laughing, then you're kicked in the gut. I dig a great big hole, and right before I come through the other side of the earth, I say something funny, and I pull you out of it. Is that humor a way to bring people in so yes. that they can really 
think about the nuances of prejudice and the other things you're talking about? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's the spoonful of sugar is what it is that I, like, that I <laughs> yeah. like to say. Yeah, it makes it a little more palatable. Yes, because otherwise it would just be it would just be too too painful for a lot of people to 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 digest. Yeah, Brian, I know you've got three kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Have they seen the show? I would guess they have. What do they think about it? How do they feel about the sort of the the the, the family's dirty laundry, so to speak, mm -hmm. being aired? When the show opened, uh, let's see, my, my kids were 15, 15 and 13, and the younger one was 9. Uh, and in fact, I learned how to portray an 8-year-old boy because he was 8 when I was writing the show, and I watched him, you know, and how he talked and how he moved. Uh, it was a long time before I let him see it. You know, the show ran seven years because uh, he was just too young. Uh, the older kids, I, I gave them a heads up, and I had to tell them about, you know, certain things, and there's, there is a, a scene where I'm really, really depressed, and I talk about this experience I had in a car with carbon monoxide they didn't know about, um, and I kind of had to warn them, and uh, it was interesting that they came out of the show saying, you know, wow, Dad, you know, we have like a deeper, uh, greater understanding of you because now we know what you dealt with and where you came from. Yeah. And then just finally, you've been doing the show for 10 years. Uh, how, how much have things changed in San Leandro and elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Well, what's fascinating is, is, according to the latest census, San Leandro is one of the most diverse cities in America. In America. Uh, it, it, when you when you uh, look at the percentage of African Americans and Asians and Latinos and so forth in the country, San Leandro mirrors that. So it's uh, it's fascinating and it's great. Changed. Yeah. All right. Well, the show again is called Not a Genuine Black Man. It's playing at Berkeley Repertory Theater through May. Brian Copeland, thanks so much for coming in. Oh, thanks for having me. Pleasure.